So, when it comes to finding the inverse functions, you realize the first major requirement for the function to have an inverse is for it to be one-to-one, -one, right? So each of these functions must be one-to-one -one for them to have an inverse. Now, the top function is a complex one because it should be split into one-to-one -one functions. As it turns out, this is not a one-to-one -one function. And I will explain to you after we do the simpler example first, because the simpler example is a one-to-one -one function, okay? And one-to-one -one function, just to remind you, is a function that does not contain a single y value that has two different x values, right? So no y value will produce two different x values, right? So that's, by definition, a one-to-one -one function, okay? So for this reason, we don't need a graph because this has a unique x value for each y value that, that we can choose, okay? So, for this reason, we can directly find the inverse without having to we worry whether this is one-to-one. -one. So I'm gonna solve this one first because it doesn't need a graph, it's easier. And then I'm gonna solve the second one because it's gonna be more complicated. So, the first thing that you do, you're gonna let fx is equal to y, and then copy down the second side information that you have. Then the next thing you're going to do, you're going to split, uh, switch the x's and the y's, right? So instead of the y, you're going to write the x. And instead of the x there, you're going to write the y. And the reason we do that is because this y is going to be the inverse. I'm going to need to solve for that y to find the inverse, right? So the first thing that you do, you divide by negative 3, both sides. When you divide by negative 3, what you get is minus x over 3 is equal to e to the 2y minus 3. Now, negative 11 divided by negative 3 is plus 11 over 3. Okay, now to solve for y, you need to isolate this part, right? You need to isolate it. I'm going to work on that side. So what we have next, we're going to have to subtract negative, uh, subtract 11 over 3. on both sides. As a result, what we get, and I'm just going to switch sides, e to the 2y minus 3 is equal to minus x over 3 minus 11 over 3. Okay, so now um, you want to take the logarithm, the natural logarithm, on both sides. And you know that ln of e is equal to 1. And before you use this, you have to take the logarithm on both sides. So that means we will have this. Now, you know that uh, from the power rule of the logarithm, you know that the power will go down and it will multiply the ln of e. Right, and that's equal to ln of minus x over 3 minus 11 over 3. Now you can use the fact that ln of e is equal to 1, so essentially 2y minus 3 is equal to this. Okay. Now I'm going to add 3 on both sides. And ultimately, you're going to subtract, uh, you're going to divide by 2 in the end, right? This goes away. So what happens is 2y is equal to ln of minus x over 3 minus 11 over 3 plus 3. Dividing both sides by 2 will do the trick and will solve for the inverse function. So as a result, the inverse function... Now, instead of dividing the first term by 2 and making it look messy, just multiply the ln by a half. That would be easier. Half ln of minus x over 3 minus 11 over 3 plus 3 over 2, right? Plus 3 seconds, right? So that would be your inverse. inverse function or the given function. 
And as you can see, we had no trouble finding it, even though algebraic, uh, algebraically it was not that easy. But there were no considerations about whether it's one-to-one -one or not, right? We definitely know it's one-to-one -one because the E functions are all one-to-one. -one. But as you're going to see now in the first example, this is not a one-to-one -one function. So let's uh, investigate this. So in the top example that you see, the first thing that you should notice is that the input of the log is not a one-to-one -one function because it's a quadratic function. Quadratic functions are not one-to-one -one in general, right? Because you know, for example, y is equal to x squared. If you were to plot y is equal to x squared, it would have two x coordinates for the same y coordinate, right? Any y coordinate you would choose, you would have two x coordinates in general, right? So the quadratic function is not one-to-one. -one. Therefore, since it's an input of the logarithm, the logarithm itself, the whole function here is not going to be one-to-one. -one. So in order to find the inverse, you have to have one-to-one -one function. So you will have to split this up into two individual one-to-one -one functions. So the first thing I would do, I would write fx equal to 5 logarithm base 7 and I would express this uh, perfect square trinomial. It happens to be a perfect square, so that means you can, be, you, you, you can factor it as x minus 11 squared, right, as the input of the log. Because you know x minus 11 squared is exactly x squared minus 22x plus 121. So again, this is a quadratic, right? The input is a quadratic that is moved 11 units to the right, right? It's, it's x squared moved 11 units to the right, shifted to the right, right? So it's a typical quadratic, except it's moved 11 units to the right. So um, now the way to make this split into two individual one-to-one -one functions, you will have to just basically carry out the normal logarithm algorithm, right? Which means that you're going to bring the power down. Uh, the 2 will multiply the 5, right? So you know uh, now, the first one-to-one -one function is going to be this, right? 2 times 5 is 10 log base 7 input x minus 11. Now, you might say, but where's the second one-to-one -one function? Is the second one possible at all? Well, it is. It is because you should realize that you can have another one-to-one -one function that looks like this, 11 minus x as the input instead of x minus 11. And why is that? Why does that work? Because notice that if you square x minus 11, and if you square 11 minus x, like it is here, it's not going to be different from this result, right? Because f x minus 11 squared is the same as the 11 minus x being squared as well, right? So there are two one-to-one -one functions possible. Now, before we find inverses of each of these one-to-one -one functions, um, let's actually draw them. Let's draw them in the xy plane here. So I have an xy plane available. I want to draw each one of them and I will show you how these two together will make the original function that was not a one-to-one -one function. Okay. In a sense you can call it a piecewise function uh, because it, it has different behaviors for, uh, for different x values. Right. So let's see. There's a, uh, in fact an asymptote. Right? As you can see, there will be an asymptote because the logarithm always has an asymptote somewhere. Right? So let's see. So as you can see from the one-to-one -one functions here, when x is equal to 11, the first one-to-one -one function will not be defined right? because 11 minus 11 is 0. Log of 0 is undefined. Right? So we know there's an asymptote that at x is equal to 11, but also there's an asymptote, the same asymptote for this one-to-one -one function, because w when you plug in x is equal to 11, you will have a log of 0, and that's not allowed, right? So let's draw an asymptote there at x is equal to 11. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right, so there is an asymptote, vertical asymptote, here. Right, that's a vertical asymptote. I was trying to indicate it with blue colors, like this. So this is this is the uh, 
y is equal to 11 is the asymptote. I'm sorry, not y, it's the x. x is equal to 11. That's a vertical asymptote, the equation of the vertical asymptote, and that's a, by definition, a line that never gets uh, to hit the, uh, either one of these one-to-one -one functions, right? They will all, they will come as close as possible, but they will never really touch it, right? That's why it's called an asymptote. So take a look at this. The first one-to-one -one function, um, notice that you can also express, um, you can express the second input as the negation of the first one, right? Because if you, let's say, uh, if you negate x minus 11, you will get precisely 11 minus x, right? Because 11 minus negative 11 is positive 11, and then minus x is there, right? So negating the first input. So what does that do, really? That simply, that simply reflects, right? This, uh, this asymptote serves as a reflection line. Right? So what this does, negating this to become the input 11 minus x, simply negates this one, uh, reflects this one-to-one -one function onto the other one through the asymptotic line x is equal to 11. And let's confirm that by graphing it. So let's see. So x minus 11 input. So we know when x is equal to 12, log of 1 as a result will be 0. Right. So we will have a point here. And as you know, this is just like a log regular logarithm. Uh, the base 7 doesn't really change its behavior, right? And we know so it falls down as it gets closer and closer to the asymptotic line. It will fall. It will never touch it. And it will rise from left to right, right? Like a typical, like a typical uh, log uh, function should. Now for this one, like we said, it's a reflection. Let's test that theory. So we know that in this time when when um, when x is equal to 10 you will have a log of 1 right because 11 minus 10 is 1 log of 1 is 0 so we know when x is equal to 10 we will have a 0 right that's already shows that it, it it is a reflection when x is equal greater than 11 let's say uh, i'm sorry greater than 10 like 10.5 log of 0 0.5 will be negative, right? So we know it's definitely going to fall from uh, left to right, right? So it's going to fall and it will behave like this, right? It will get closer and closer to the, um, to the asymp asymptotic line, x is equal to 11. So now let's test the, um, let's test x is equal to 0 for this, uh, for this one, right? When, when x is equal to 0, we will have log of 11 log of 11 uh, divided by log of 7 multiplied by 10 is something like 12.3 or something like that. I can confirm that. Log of 11 divided by log of 7 times 10 is about 12.3, right? So we definitely know it, it rises from right to left, right? So it is definitely a reflection of the first one-to-one -one function that we drew to the right of the asymptotic line. So 12.3 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So something, something like there, right? So we know it's definitely going to rise like that, right? And et cetera, et cetera. It's not a perfect graph, but you see that there will be a similar, uh, this, this type of behavior and the similar behavior on the other side, right? So from left to right, it will rise infinitely. So the point is that these two one-to-one -one functions are actually images, mirror images of each other through the asymptotic line. So the asymptotic line serves to be the, um, the um, line of reflection in this case. So now that we found the one-to-one -one functions, the next thing that you should understand is that when you find the inverses, each inverse of uh, the one-to-one -one function in question will be reflection of that one-to-one -one function through the line y is equal to x, right? So this is why I drew this line, okay? So let's find the first, uh, the first um, inverse. So taking this, we need to first substitute the 
f1 of x with y. So we're going to set it to be 10 log base 7 x minus 11. Then we divide both sides. Uh, well, first, before you divide, you have to switch your y's and x's. So x, y will be x, and then the x will become y. That's essentially what inverse and uh, original function relationship is about, right? You switch the x's and y's, and then solve for that y. That will be the inverse function, right? So that's going to be 10 log base 7 y minus 11. So dividing both sides by 10 will give us this result y minus 11. And then um, <clears throat> we know to get rid of the log 7 here, we have to use the base 7 as the base of the exponent. And the exponents will be respectively these two sides, right? So the left side will become an exponent to base 7, and base 7 will be on the right side, and the exponent for that will be the right original side, log, log base 7, y minus 11. And this kills this part right here right it will take that away and it will bring down the y minus 11 in the front right that's the uh, property of logarithm that you should uh, recognize so now so now as a result y minus 11 i'm just switching sides here of the equation is equal to 7 to the power of x over 10 so as a result the first the first uh inverse that you found for the first one-to-one -one function is going to be, now you add 11 on both sides, so it's going to be 7 to the x over 10 plus 11. Let's investigate this. So also you should realize that you see that 12.3 point here. Well, actually, let's see. This point um, 12 comma 0. 12 comma 0 uh, the point for the uh, the the point for the uh, inverse that you found will be zero comma twelve, right? Because you you virtually switch the x's and the y's for the one to one and the inverse, right? To find the inverse, you switch the x's and the y's and you solve for y. So therefore, for the point twelve comma zero for this one to one function, the inverse will definitely have a point zero comma twelve, right? The opposite of that. Now zero comma twelve will be right there, okay? And we know, based on the fact that there should be reflection through the line y is equal to x, it naturally feels like this inverse should rise as x gets positive from the negative, and it should fall as x gets negative, right? So what I'm getting at, it should look something like this, right? It should look something like this, except um, here's what we have to realize. Uh, it will definitely fall, but we have to understand how far it falls. You know that um, you know that the domain of this one-to-one -one function that we've that we've explored starts from 11, right? It cannot be less than less than 11 because uh, we cannot have uh, less than less than the zero for the input of the log. Zero doesn't work itself, right? Because that's the asymptote, but more so, less than zero cannot work, right? So we cannot have less than 11, otherwise we will have less than zero, right? We cannot go to the left of this asymptotic line. For this reason, so the, dom the domain for will be 11 comma infinity. Now for the same reason, the range will also be the same for the inverse. The range, the list of y values for the inverse that we found will be 11 comma infinity, right? We already have a y-intercept of 12 here, so that means 11 will be the asymptotic line for the inverse, right? Y, uh, y is equal to 11, right? So we know that it's definitely going to fall, but it's never going to reach 11, right? It's going to be that way, and it's going to rise from left to right like this, right? This inverse. So we already know that. Right now, so we we've explored that we can test that theory. If you plug in x is equal to negative ten, for example, you will have one uh, one over seven. Right, seven to the negative one power is one over seven. Test the x value of negative ten and see for yourself. And one over seven is so small. Right, eleven plus one over seven is definitely greater 
than if you were to plug in zero. If you plug in zero, you will get one, right? Seven to the zero power is one. 11 plus one is 12, right? So we've, we've confirmed our original suspicion that uh, we just have to switch, switch the x's and the y's, right? We said that it was 12, zero here and zero, 12 there. We confirmed that by plotting, by putting in x is equal to zero and we got seven to the zero power. Seven to the zero power is one. One plus 11 is 12, right? But if you plug in negative 10, the, the more negative you go, the closer and closer you will get to the asymptotic horizontal line, y is equal to uh, 11, right? Because seven to the minus one is one over seven. One over seven is definitely smaller than one that we added before when we were talking about this point. So that means we're getting closer and closer to 11. If you put an x is equal to 10 on the other side, right? You will get seven to the first power. Seven to the first power is seven. 11 plus seven is 18. 18 is definitely greater than 12 here, right? So it definitely rises. It definitely rises and it confirms the look of this, right? Because this is definitely reflected through the line y is equal to x. Just picture these two and you will see that the inverse definitely reflects through the line y is equal to x with the behavior that we just realized that it should have. Now, let's find the inverse of the second one-to-one -one function. And this one-to-one -one function is this one, right? This half of it. And to picture the inverse will be much harder because um, uh, uh, be because, uh, because the original one-to-one, -one, the second one-to-one -one function passes through the line of reflection, right? So it will be harder for you to picture how, uh, how indeed the... Um, the inverse uh, looks along with the second one-to-one -one function, right? But let's solve for it first. So we, we're going to substitute y with this one. And then log base 7, 11 minus x. Then dividing both sides by 10, just like we did in the first example. No, actually, before we divide, we have to switch, switch x's and the y. So x is equal to 10 log base 7, 11 minus y, right? So Dividing both sides by 10 will give us this, 11 minus y. And then 7 to the x over 10 is equal to 11 minus y. And if you don't understand how I did that, just look at this left side again. You will see the algorithm. And then we know we add y on both sides and subtract 7 to the x over 10 on both sides. We'll solve that way for the inverse, right? So the second inverse, subscript two, is gonna be uh, 11 minus seven to the x over 10, okay? So let's test some points for this inverse and, and we, we shall see if we can try to see if there is any visual representation of the uh, reflection through the line y is equal to x for the inverse and the original. Let's test that. So uh, we know, first of all, that the that the x-intercept was what? X-intercept was 10 comma 0. So that means for this one, the y-intercept should be 0 comma 10, right? The x's and y should switch. Let's confirm that. Let's plot that first and confirm it algebraically. So 0 comma 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So the y-intercept for this inverse should be 0 comma 10. So if, if you plug in 0 here, what you're going to have is 7 to the 0 power, right? Because 0 divided by 10 is 0. 7 to the 0 power is 1. 11 minus 1 is, bingo, 10, right? So confirm. Now, naturally, naturally, you might, you might say, um, just like these two one-to-one -one functions, they approached this asymptotic vertical line here don't don't the doesn't the inverse of the second one-to-one -one function here should approach the asymptotic horizontal line y is equal to 11 the same way like the one on the top of it you're absolutely right it will right it will do exactly that it will approach it but it will never hit it right and to confirm that to confirm that just let your x be equal to negative 10 right and you will see it's gonna be definitely greater than 10 and it, the result will be greater than 10, but smaller than 11. Let's test that. 
Uh, negative 10 over 10 is negative 1. 7 to the negative 1 is 1 over 7. 11 minus 1 over 7 is greater than 10, but it's less than 11, right? So it means it's in between, right? It's, it's getting closer and closer to 11. Uh, the more negative the x gets, right? So that's good. Now, let's see uh, what happens if we plug in 10 instead for the x, right? If we plug in 10 for the x, we will get 10 over 10, which is 1. 7 to the 1 is 7. So that means 11 minus 7 is going to be 4, right? So that means when x is equal to 10, you will get 4. Let's see. 10, 10 and 4. Right? So this is going to be the point. Okay? This is going to be the point. Now, I want you to notice that the green line wasn't drawn exactly well as it should have been. I'm just going to test the point. So I know this is a point. And keep in mind, you might say, but isn't this an asymptotic line? It's an asymptotic line for the one-to-one -one function, but it's not an asymptotic line for the inverse, right? Because we're pr plotting the inverse function, right? The inverse has an asymptotic line that is horizontal y is equal to 11. So don't get confused by the fact that it seems to pass the x is equal to 11 vertical line. It has nothing to do with it, right? It's an inverse. Actually, we can actually find out where the uh, inverse hits the x-axis easily, right? Because we know where, where the one-to-one uh, -one function, the second one here, hit the y-axis. That was about, about 12.3, right, that we've explored. That means 12.3 for the x will be the place, the x value for which the inverse of this one-to-one -one function hits the x-axis, right? So 12.3 is about here, right? Because this was 12, so that was here. So definitely looks like it's traveling like this, right? It's not the best picture, but you get the idea, right? So it's definitely going to fall. It's definitely going to fall from left to right, right? So... I hope this was a lot of help, so thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video.